Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Welcome. My name is Cliff Wabi, and I'm the Public Programs Director here at the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. And on behalf of the National Archives and Records Administration, I would like to thank you all for coming out to the ninth annual Hudson Valley History Reading Festival and our first in-person program in 778 days. It's also a hybrid program too, so um, we are pushing out to our official social media accounts. But yeah, 778 days ago we gave our last in-person program. So if you play the numbers, that's a lucky number today. Um, I also want to thank our friends and partners, the Friends of the Poughkeepsie Public Library, for partnering with us uh, for this program. Uh, quick question, any members in the audience today? Fantastic. Great, thank you. Um, also, keep in mind that um, if you want to become a member today, there are discounts in the store, so the author's books um, that are being sold, uh, which the author should be signing, will also come at a discount if you become a member today. You can do that right in the Moonfield store itself. I also did want to just make a quick note that Shannon Butler, who is our uh, 2 p.m. speaker today, um, in, in a, did speak with her this morning. And she told me I could, I could tell the, the whole story is that she tested positive for COVID yesterday um, and wanted to make sure everybody realizes this is still a very real thing. Um, we thankfully, because it's a hybrid setup today, she, we can pipe her in at 2 p.m. from her home. Um, so she'll be up on the big screen um, if she's feeling up to snuff, we're going to check in at noon time. Um, but just a heads up on that as well. Um, as far as the virtual audience goes, uh, just uh, keep in mind for those of you watching out there that uh, all of the links for the individual talks are in the description on both Facebook and YouTube. So at the top of each hour, you just need to refresh that link. Um, and before we get started with our first author, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the format. I know there are a lot of familiar faces here, so you know the format quite well. But what we're going to do is at the top of each hour, at 10, 11, 1, and 2, with the exception of noon, where we'll take an hour-long lunch break. Uh, Uncle Sam's canteen is open, so if you want to grab lunch down there, feel free to do that. Um, we're going to have authors speaking for about 30 minutes. Uh, then we'll take a little bit of time for Q&A, and then at about a quarter of, the authors will go out to the front in the lobby outside the New Deal store and sign copies of their books. And then at the top of the next hour, we do it all over again. So that, that is the format for today. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, A.J. Shankman. He is a New York City-based writer, a New York-based writer, excuse me, he's the author of several books about local, regional, and national history. His latest books are Patriots and Spies and Revolutionary New York, which he'll be speaking about today, and Unexpected Bravery, Women and Children of the Civil War. AJ is the town historian of the town of uh, Gardner, and uh, check out his website, ajshankman.com, and also listen to his new podcast, the History Knickerbocker on Apple Podcasts. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for A.J. Shanker. Thank you uh, so much. Um, I am absolutely blown away to be here. I'm excited. Um, when I was driving in this morning, I was thinking about the first time I came here when I was 10 years old, before all this existed. Um, I'm 53 years old now. I just really use good facial products and stuff like that. Um, and I do plan on having facelifts until my ears meet. No, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, um, and it's just, I during the pandemic, this was like my second home during the lockdown, wandering around, also Val Kill. Um, uh, people here are so wonderful. My son became a park ranger here, not a real park ranger, he's eight years old. And, uh, <laughs> and also uh, one at uh, Val Kill. And uh, even my dog, which we adopted during uh, the pandemic, a golden retriever named Petty Yoder, um, he, uh, he was made a park ranger. So, um, so we spent a lot of time here, and um, so this is just so exciting um, to be here. 
So um, let me uh, start up. And I think that worked. There we go. So what we'll be talking about today, um, I'm going to try to do it in 30 minutes. Um, I know I will. Uh, I think a big cane comes out and pulls me off. Um, so, uh, but I, for Cornelius has for a Patriot or Spy, for those of you who are familiar with the area, um, that's the Hasbrook House in Newburgh. Uh, that was Washington's headquarters in uh, Newburgh, 1782 to 83. But it was Jonathan Hasbrook House. Um, just a little bit of background of uh, my new release with Roman and Littlefield. Um, and what's really important, um, as a school teacher, I see this during the pandemic. Um, I guess the word they use is food insecurity. So I've always been about doing something for your little area, your community. Um, I did that when I was a first responder. I've done that as a teacher. And I try to kind of give back to my kids as well, and my students, as well as my son. So um, there's a place called People's Place. And um, it's a non-for-profit organization feeding clothing and responding to the needs of the people in Ulster County with kindness, compassion, and the preservation of human dignity since 1972. Um, and it helps address, it's a food pantry, and it helps with that food insecurity um, in Ulster County. And all the profits from um, this book will be donated um, to you. Thank you. Come on, come on. Um, and um, my uh, other new release is uh, Unexpected Bravery. Um, I've never cried so much from writing a book. Where do I get my inspiration from? Um, my students, just the questions they ask. Um, were there any children that were um, in the Civil War? Um, you know, uh, African American children asking me, were there any African Americans? who actually fought in the war on the northern side, etc. Um, other books where some of you might know me, Murder and Mayhem in Ulster County, my first book, Washington's Headquarters in Newburgh, it's a pictorial history. Um, I was the um, a consulting story, that story at uh, store Keganot Street, and we redid um, Barry and Brown, the uh, booklet. And then, of course, a more academic version of Washington's headquarters in Newburgh, but it's more about the Hasbro's. And finally, 75th anniversary of Wallkill Central Schools, um, I um, wrote a book with Elizabeth M. Merlot on uh, the history of it, and specifically about the Gordons. Uh, and then, well, and actually, this is finally uh, Wicked Ulster County, Tales of Gangs, Desperados, and More, which came directly from my students. Um, wanting to know um, all the crazy stuff that went on in the county. So I'm um, seventh grade um, and sometimes eighth grade social studies teacher. Yes, I teach seventh graders, and yes, I love it. At the John G. Gordon Middle School, um, yes, from Gordon fame, LT, uh, you know, Gordon and all that. Um, Town of Gardner story, and, and I teach in the room the far guy on the on right is Kenny Hasbro, um, who basically founded the store at Huguenot Street, and I with, will be talking a little bit about uh, some of the research he did. So looking for clues, um, this is when I start to show my age, um, you know, Peter Sellers, and I recognized him on Get Back with the Beatles. I recognized him. I know he's friends with the Beatles. But anyway, I'm looking for clues. I read so much about the Hasbro, so much about Washington's headquarters, and there's this gaping hole in historiography, and that gaping hole is Cornelius Hasbro. He just disappears from history, and just find little nuggets. He was um, in, uh, he, he went to Nova Scotia, um, he escaped the Pope espousing the cause of the king. Uh, he just, then um, some people just said that he just disappeared. He's not mentioned in any kind of family records or anything. So one of the things I always tell my students is you are like a detective. And what I really enjoy doing is finding those primary sources and reconstructing somebody's life. And I think of a book I used to read called uh, Joe's Two Trees, where Joe Two Trees says, as long as you're telling my story, I'm always going to be alive. 
And I kind of think that's what I do with history. So was he a loyalist in 1776 who fled to Nova Scotia? Well, Ralph the Beaver said yes. The Daily Freeman said yes. Um, but no, uh, he did not flee to Nova Scotia. We'll get to why there's a controversy around it, but I kind of have to build it up a little bit. Um, you're not going to be able to see it. I'm sorry, it's on my computer. I can make it a little larger. Um, but um, in the newspaper, it talks a little bit about, again, they don't know where he went, but they believe that he went to Nova Scotia. So the person who was on to something was Ken Hasbrook, Kenny Hasbrook Sr. And you can see that it says um, that Cornelius Hasbrook was born in 1755, his name in the road list in circa 1785, in the petition in 1816. And as he says, the theory has been advanced that he was a Tory and moved to Canada. Now, Ken Hasbrook, you can tell by the haircut and everything like that, he didn't have access to the computers. So he had to go through lots and lots of loose newspaper. I remember my graffiti, and it's just not a fun thing to do. So what I can do is I can go on the internet and I can search two million papers in seconds. So that's where I started. And I started in digitized documents, just looking, looking, and looking, and looking, and getting dead end after dead end after dead end. So I got into a very large, yeah, that's my Eminem reference. So the real Slim Shady, please stand up. But um, I got into quite an argument with somebody who I will not ever say his name. It wasn't bad. It wasn't, he didn't break into fisticuffs or anything like that. But he said, you got the wrong Cornelius, man. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't. I know that I don't have the wrong Cornelius. And I'll show you the references that I found and all that. But again, I gotta build you up a little bit. Um, so my kid said it best, instead of calling him Cornelius or Cornelius, he calls him Cornelius. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, so I had to go through Kennedy Hasbrook Sr.'s math genealogy, where every Hasbrook who descended from two brothers who came over from France to the Americas. And so I went through using his genealogy, um, and I found that the only Cornelius old enough to have been involved in the Revolutionary War was Cornelius Hasbrook, who was born in 1720, the brother of Colonel Johnson Hasbrook, and Cornelius Hasbrook, his son, 1755. There's Cornelius B. There's lots of other Cornelii um, living in the area. But they're not old enough to have fought in the Civil War. They would not have been able to be involved in any of the major events. So now where do we go? That's genealogy. So where does this all begin? It begins one morning when I'm exceedingly bored, waiting for my dog to finish eating, waiting for the cat to get off the computer. So I'm at the line at 5 o'clock in the morning, waiting for everything, take my dog for a walk. And I just got a new copy of George Clinton, not the guy from Parliament, <laughs> but the governor of New York. I had a brand new book of his that was translated by Hugh Hastings. Thank God, because in 1911, the New York State Archives burns and most of Clinton's papers are gone. So I go through this, judge, uh, I find a letter, Judge Yates. Um, about Hasbrook, um, who was stealing continental cattle. And it happened, and this happens, you know, where he's on uh, this letter about all day, January 13th, 1781. And I won't go through the whole thing, but just he's accused of stealing cattle. And he is branded. And there are depositions. And there are depositions taken in Kingston. And at one point, it makes it to the Continental Congress. And I guess that would be the second Continental Congress. And it says, look, we want to make an example of this guy. This guy's got a lot of money. And we really think we better do it soon or we're not going to be able to do it. So it said, a little note by the state historian, depositions omitted. And I'm like, so there are depositions. 
So I said to my friend, I said, how come no one's ever found them? And he said, because no one's out of care. And I'm like, that's what? But so I call up, I hope you don't mind using his name, Bill Gorman of the New York State Archives. And I said, what's the chances that these depositions exist? He said, well, you know about the fire in 1911, so I don't think it exists. So, you know, I'll look, but I don't think it's there. I get a call back. Hey, they're there. This was absolutely amazing. So we can get past that. That's just more of the same. So in these depositions, and I'll show you pictures of them, in these depositions, they not only refer to Colonel Jonathan Hasbro, who was dead by this time, 1781 and 11, but Jonathan Hasbro's house, his farm, but also key neighbors around during that period. So I knew who lived in this, what today is the city of Newburgh, I knew who lived in that area. And you could trace the farms, you could trace the maps, and you could trace when it says Colonel Hasbrook's farm, there's only one Colonel Hasbrook living in that sleepy, sleepy village at that point. And in other depositions, they refer to Hasbrook's mills and his meadow. Unfortunately, the slaves' names were omitted because the bird mark makes it down there. I was able to unearth at one point and do her one of his slaves' name. Quotations I was telling my students um, because this was his name, Negro Raw. And we know, I know that he lived in that home. So maybe it was him, I don't know. So that's what the original depositions look like from located in New York State Archives. So, what happens in a nutshell, um, I go into detail, but I'm constrained by time, is that um, the best fields in, in the area of Hasbro's fields, his meadows. So Newburgh is a central clearing place for the Continental Army. So all the foods, it's, uh, it's like the quartermaster's headquarters. And you have the Continental Ferry that's there as well, which I believe is right by uh, where the Newburgh Beacon Bridge is today. Um, and the Army is keeping cows at Hasbro on Hasbro's Meadow. And there are in the depositions, Cornelius is very angry because he's not being paid for these cows. They are behind in the money that they owe them, the quartermaster's part of it. And also, he is, um, they're doing a lot of damage. So he says, you know what I'll do? I'll just take a couple and I'll sell them. God, that doesn't look kindly. <laughs> I, I have paid taxes this year. I owe money. They cashed that check in a week, less than a week. But my refund is going to wait two years. So, on the you know, uh, state for refund. So, the federal government plays by its rules, I guess. Well, the federal government doesn't exist at the time like that. So, he gets caught. And when he gets caught, Long story short, they interview people who were involved in this. And that's what these depositions are. And they begin talking about, you know, um, they name place names, and which allowed me to kind of break that code. Okay, um, here you go again. These are in good condition. Um, I thought I had some that were a little bit more burned. Um, so then I went to the uh, located more depositions located in the Ulster County Archive, and those are more local people that are up here, um, more towards Kingston, I say up here, across the river. Um, so, and with these two individuals, they talk about an additional cow um, or steer that is, still, that is taken by, um, uh, by uh, Cornelius Hasbro. And what's interesting about Cornelius Hasbro is he said, this is a milch cow, it's down by the mill, Hasbro's mill, um, what did you, um, you know, why don't we go get it? You know, it's been offered it to me, and I'm going to, you know, we can just kind of slaughter it. And the two gentlemen that are uh, giving a deposition say, it's got a bell around its neck. Um, it's got to be an old person's cow, and we don't want to take an old person's cow. So Cornelius Hazard says, oh, okay, okay, then uh, I got another one over here. He said, put it on the Continental uh, tan line. Um, it's an army cow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bought it up here. So Cornelius is uh, doing a lot of lying 
um, about where he's getting the cattle, but people were still buying them, and again, then they get called. So moving right along, um, so Cornelius Hasbro gets eventually sprung from jail. He is, um, he's branded. He's got the restitution for the cattle. And in 1781, when this is all kind of breaking, that's really bad that one, you're branded, and two, you were stealing cattle as, you know, and you're not a patriot if you do things like that. You're taking food right out of so uh, soldiers' mouths, you know. So they began to brand him as a royalist. So why does he hang around? Why does Cornelius Hasbro hang around Newburgh? Well, we know that he doesn't leave in 1776 because he's still holding public positions. We still, even though, you know, he's got this kind of letter on him now, but we also know that um, he's in his father's, uh, and later his mother's account book. And there's other ways that we know that he's also in um, Newburgh as well. So what's he waiting around for? He's also waiting around for his youngest brother to turn 21 so that he can start getting all his father's lands that are owed him. And so now I'm in another situation where I can't find any deed. I can't find any information about him selling his property, about him leaving the world and going to where he ultimately ends up. And I go to Orange County, nothing there. And then someone said to me, which sometimes you don't realize, Newburgh was part of Ulster County. So what's the chances that it was deposited in the Ulster County Clerk's um, vault? And that's where I found a lot of the deeds. A lot of the deeds that he's selling the mill, he's selling all of his property. But it still says he lives in Ulster County, in Newburgh. So, historic Huguenot Street to the rescue, and the ex archivist there, Eric Ross, um, he comes up with a paper. Now, what's interesting is that somewhere in someone's attic, there's lots of information on this guy. And that's what happened here. Uh, I remember the last year or so I worked at uh, Stork Huguenot Street, someone had a fire in their home. And they went up into the attic and they found this metal box. And when they opened it, it was all of these documents from the 1700s that they didn't even know were in their attic. And actually, one of them is a cipher in the book of Philip Hasbrook, um, whose uh, present home, Philip Hasbrook's home, is now Robert De Niro's home, and actually in Gardner. So Robert De Niro, I've been told, is very excited because he wants to know the history of his, of his house. But getting away from that, as far as historic Huguenot Street, someone has a similar issue. It wasn't a fire, they were just cleaning out a house and found all the stuff related to Jonathan Hasbro and his family. So what I found in that was that lands were sold to Isaac in the Jacobus Kip and Company patent in Orange County, sold for $500. So it states, formerly of Newburgh, so I know he's gone by 1800. They don't say where he's going, but shortly after he's being looked for, an 1803 notice in the Court of Chancery, which is equity, um, it's believed that he's either residing out of state or concealing himself. Some people believe he's concealing himself. Some people just believe that no one's looking for him because he was an embarrassment. I mean, to be quite frank, quite frank about it. So how do I locate him again? Well, once again, in archives, there are ads looking um, in newspapers, looking for Cornelius Hasbro. And the first thing you see, everyone's Cornelius back then. So Cornelius Hasbro, I'm sorry if you have trouble seeing that, died in spring of 1816. He was pretty much left everything by his father, Cornelius Sr., just to make it a little bit more confusing. The father of Trencha and grandfather of Cornelius Hasbro, um, her father died in 1781. So, what's going on with this is that they, um, the, the, the descendants 
that are still alive that are not the children, if I'm saying it right, of Cornelius or the brothers and sisters of Cornelius Jr. They want a piece of it. So this is a good old fashioned contesting a will. So everybody's looking for everybody to get their piece of the pie. So at one point, the person who's handling all this is the attorney is John Sudo of Kingston, who's very, very well known. And so we're talking around 1817 now, and there are foreclosure notices in the paper. There are looking for um, a public notice of looking for Cornelius Hasbrook, if anybody can find him. And this would have been this is the petition to partition, which is what they're hoping to do. And again, in 1818, um, I find that the land of Cornelius Du Bois are now in foreclosure. The reason given is that the members of the family did not or could not reimburse petitioners for court costs. The original petition for partition sued Cornelius Hasbro and others to recover the costs. So now where are we looking? Now we're going to legal records. And now we're going to deed records. So I'm looking up under Cornelius Hasbrook and I'm finding nothing. So what I did is I began looking up under Cornelius Du Bois. I began looking up under Cornelius's um, brothers and sisters. Then finally, there's a judgment against Cornelius et al. in the Court of Common Pleas in Kingston. The last minute, Daniel Hasbrook um, and another family member, Reuben Rudd, um, save, swoop in and save the property. So. Where do we go from here? We go from here as we go to, I go back to the deeds, something I overlooked, and I find, I look up under John Sudom, I cross-reference it to Cornelius, back to Cornelius Hasbrook, and I find through documents, and I'll show you in a minute, that Cornelius Hasbrook is in fact in Upper Canada. So they had it right, he is in Canada, post 18, uh, probably around 1800 but he's not in Nova Scotia, he's in Upper Canada. Upper Canada included all of modern day Southern Ontario and all those areas of Northern Ontario. And I just gotta tell you, while I'm doing this, I just, it's just, it's making me crazy. It's just like, it, it, and just the craziness of having to find this guy and why can't you just show up? Why do you have to make it so difficult? Why can't you make it easier for me? So, um, but thank God for the internet. Uh, today, it is located just over the Ambassador Bridge. Both town and country do not exist today. It's part of Windsor, Ontario. We're going to put aside the fact the War of 1812. We're going to put aside the fact fires and records that aren't kept. So right now, I am at a dead end. And that's the deed where he says, I, Cornelius Hasbrook, um, and I don't know if this is the one I put up there, but formerly of Newburgh. And he says now of Upper Canada. And then in some of these deeds, he begins listing his properties. And he lists his brothers and sisters. And not only that, he is also um, selling all of his property in Newburgh. I, I just, you know, I, I, you got to love that guy. I just, I used to watch him as a kid with my dad. That and um, I couldn't get fit him in here, but also uh, the Rockford Files. That's, that's my, um, I alternate in ringtones on my phone between Havana Gila and, um, and uh, what's the other one? And uh, the Rockford Files. But when my son calls me, it's the Muppet Show. So pandemic comes in. I'm at a dead end. I've been doing, I've been researching this guy since 1995. And I hit a dead end. I can't go to Canada now because of the pandemic. I'm still looking for him. I'm going to bed at night, picturing him in my head. And turning, and obviously I, I don't want to give you everything so I want you to buy the book too. Um, but I really, was, was he a patriot gone wrong? Was he an entitled rich brat? 
um, because Cornelia, uh, because Colonel Hasbrook was very, very wealthy in 1767. He's the wealthiest man in um, Newburgh. His brother Abraham, whose home is still sitting up there, I think it's on Green Street in Kingston. He is, uh, I think he's the wealthiest person at one point in Ulster County. But, or did he really have some ill intent? I mean, was it just really a mistake? So my, one of my last emails was with a guy by the name of Gordon Pym, great name. Um, certainly there are many reasons why someone may seem to disappear because that part of the province, our modern day Windsor area has changed hands a few times over the years. The reason someone may seem to disappear is because they technically no longer live there even though they are still there. So I think about Monty Python, the art of how not to be seen. Because the area has become known by another name, example, Upper Canada before it became the province of Ontario, as well as a person, for whatever reasons, may change the spelling of his family name or change the name entirely. Um, what I, my theory at this point is that Hasbrook did not want to be found. Um, he definitely did not want to be found. So that's where I end. Um, that's what I left this morning. Um, I've got to get that dog to stop eating stuff off the side of the road. Um, but he, um, uh, he is, um, I heard that golden retrievers lack the gene in their brain um, to tell them that they're not hungry anymore. But, um, and I love the little pencil thin mustache and everything like that. So um, do we have any questions? That's the end. If you want to, um, uh, find more out more about me. Uh, you can go to ajshankman.com, and I try to give you know a little bit of taste of uh, Cornelius Hasbrook. I've written a lot about him and the Hasbrook family. Um, Robert Hasbrook came up to me at Huguenot Street once, and he said to me, "He said, why are you always picking on my family?" And I'm like, "I'm not picking on your family." And then I quoted another author. I said. If your family wanted to be remembered better, they should have behaved better in life. So, but, uh, you know, but it's no hard feelings. Any questions going on? Oh, yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Is there a pattern, since you've done a lot of research over the years, is there a pattern between what you're able to find on the internet and what you need to go individually or personally to archives in various places? Um, I, a lot of the places I like to go there and I like to see the documents. Um, I like, like, I mean, I remember doing research up in the FDR archives and I think so anyway, I was holding the actual documents that some of these people handled. And, you know, and I, there's just some nuances I feel that the paper, that the, digitized do not capture. And also there are some things that aren't digitized, um, like the depositions. You're just never gonna find those online. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I think that, uh, um, I, and also I like to travel. It gives me time to get out of the house, you know? So, but now my kid's old enough and he wants to come with me. So, <laughs> yes. I'm a retired school teacher. And I'm picturing you with your seventh graders. And I, I, it's wonderful that you not only have this job of teaching your seventh graders history, but you're... you're I have a captive audience. You're, no, you're, lear right. you're learning. It's like your hobby and your job yeah. are all melded together. Yeah, and so, some of them are on, actually, some of them um, are watching from at home and stuff. <laughs> they, get, they get such a blast out of it, seeing this stuff. But I'm sorry, I interrupted. It's just, I mean, you have to be an actor in the classroom, and you're you love what you're doing, and you mm -hmm. love your research, and uh, the these kids are lucky to have you. <clears throat> and no, the last, thank you, thank the, you. The last thing you kept saying. I'm giving a test on Monday, so I don't know if that'll happen. <laughs> They're not so happy about that. Uh, <laughs> but the last thing is, you kept saying he was branded. He was branded, and I kept picturing. You know, he stole steer, so does he have this actual branding on him? It was, it was making um, I, usually a lot of times they, they would brand you right here. They might brand you. I mean, when I'm, I should have uh, been better about saying that, like branding like, like they would to a cow. Um, so anyone who sees you, 
um, knows that you did something bad. Like sometimes they would brand the side of your face. And it was such a small village. Everyone knew. Everyone knew what he did. And it was an embarrassment. And there's a diary um, written by his uh, brother. And his brother records everything. He even records, um, you, know, uh, you know, the snow and the we all weather events and family events. This guy is literally erased from the family record which, you know, um, I got to find out, you know, I got to find out. I mean, that's part of, you know, and the primary sources are those like kind of raw materials that, you know, you reconstruct his life. And a lot of stuff is scattered, but, you know, you asked, um, follow up on a question, this gentleman here asked about, you know, finding documents and looking for them and digitized. Um, the British burning Washington, D.C. in the in the War of 1812, a lot of Revolutionary War documents that were lost. And I've been told by archivists up at uh, New York State Archives that we don't even know what we lost um, in that fire in 1911 when they were just around to move into a new building. I mean, it was devastating. It was really devastating. Um, so, um, so some of that stuff is just not there. Yes, go ahead. I think I heard it. What was the nature of his treason or betrayal? Um, stealing his, government property. And what was his crime? His crime was he took continental cattle. Right. And he sold them. I heard all about the cattle, but I didn't know if that was the crime. And Oh, yeah. And, and That's what a was, crime. Was he branded as a thief? He was branded as a thief. Okay. He was branded as a thief. All right. I'm, I'm sorry I missed the significance of it, but patriot, no, 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 that's fine. Patriot that's fine. Or, or traitor, I thought maybe there was something else about being a, I, you know, a secret Tory. But I think what happened is people like Ralph Lefevre probably talking to, I want to say contemporaries, but maybe his grandsons like Eli Hasbrook and Jonathan Hasbrook III, um, you, know, uh, you know, I mean, like you always hear these family stories, maybe they they refer to him as, you know, a traitor, you know, because it does say almost a verbatim quote um, in Ralph Lefevre. It says, espousing the cause of the king, he fled to Nova Scotia in 1776. So they obviously, what had been passed down, even anecdotally, um, is that he, um, what he did was not looked at very kindly. And I mean, I, if I had more time, I would have placed Colonel Jonathan Hasbrook more in perspective too. I mean, this is a guy who hobnobs with um, Governor Clinton. This is a man who is very wealthy. The family is very, very distinguished. Colonel Hasbrook is helps in building Fort Montgomery. I mean, he's, a, he's he knows the Coldens, and here to have your son doing something like this. Um, it's not as bad as taking government secrets, but he's taking continental cattle. And he's, and I mean, you know, seven, eight of these cattle, and he is selling them as his own and taking the profit for it. So that's, you know, not, you know, and that's not a good thing. I mean, if you stole something now from the federal government, you know, you would be branded a thief. It's a felony what he does. And in the depositions, it says it's a felony. Um, so um, who was the uh, owner of uh, the building when it became Washington's headquarters? And how did it become Washington's headquarters? Um, the Hasbrooks, Jonathan Hasbrook III, um, lost it through default. Um, he took out a mortgage, uh, a state mortgage, could not afford to pay it back, and he lost it. So the state of New York took it over, um, and it became the first historic site of its kind on July 4th, 1850. We're going to take one last question. I'm a retired college teacher, and I know what motivated me to co-author several books. My question is, what motivated you to do all this research uh, and the writing? Um, my students definitely are really kind of their questions and me just pursuing things, my own curiosity. The Hasbrooks is a temper tantrum. Uh, when I worked at Washington's headquarters when I was in my 20s, um, well, I think of that song, um, 
what is it? I, I, I wish that I knew so much. That I wish I knew what I knew now or something like that, that I was so, I'm so much wiser now. I forgot the song. It was on tip of my tongue. But um, as, as far as um, I didn't want to talk about Washington, you know, it's the Hasbro house. I wanted to talk about the Hasbrooks. So the more they told me to talk about Washington, the more I talked about the Hasbrooks. So I began billing my talk as the un-Washington um, tour. And, um, and then one day, um, and what part started that too, is this little old woman who said to me, um, she goes, I, I, I've heard all of this about the uh, Washington and all that. What about the Hasbrooks? And I'm like, wow, 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 wow. And she's like, I know all that. She says, do you even know that you're in a Hasbrook house? She said, this was built by Jonathan Hasbrook. And she gave me a lesson on the Hasbrooks and on Jonathan Hasbrook. And I became very interested in it, but also it was my own little way to rebel, you know, talking more and more about Jonathan. But I've always, when, I've, when I walked through the house there, of course, when I was in college, I would, uh, was in charge sometimes of cleaning that place. Um, you know, and making sure everything was nice in there. And I, um, I could walk through there and just imagine all the trials and tribulations that went on in that house. I mean, he had two children that died in that house. In, one, in the bedroom I was standing in, he died in that house. And seeing, picturing Washington hitting his head on the low ceiling. Um, but, you know, just picturing Washington in there and, you know, in his aide de camp, and you know, and it's just, um, I've always been able to kind of like, I've liked reconstructing people's lives and reconstructing history. I mean, all throughout my life, even as a kid, um, I, I worked at the Queens County Farm Museum. Um, I was always kind of interested in some sort of history, even with coins, wondering, you know, did this coin whose hands it passed through and stuff like that. And even when I walk through the mansion here, uh, FDR's mansion, it's like I, I can see everything playing out. But I want to know more. I want to know, like, the, what my students like about my class is that I also take these historical figures and I make them human, you know, um, you know, like John Adams, you know, and, you know, and stuff like that, you know, and I enjoy that. And I also enjoy the less common people that their only testament to being alive is a headstone in a cemetery and stuff like that. So just like a teacher, you ask a question, you know, what is it? Uh, uh, was it two teachers, three opinions? I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, um, I thank you so much. You know, you, you know, you guys are so wonderful. All right, folks, we're going to take a 15-minute break, and AJ will be signing copies of his book down by the New Deal store, and we'll see you at the top of the hour. Why do you have? Why do you have?